Uncle Tim. So I have a quick question for you. I have been wrestling with this and I have searched out in scripture as well as asking uh, wise counsel and I'm getting both responses. So I have a friend who's a believer and this person smokes pot, smokes weed and says that they need it for, um, it helps them to get into prayer. It helps their anxiety. And, but God has told them that it's only temporary and, um, and that it's okay. And that this person is not sinning by doing so. And, um, I've, I've told her in love that I, I would have to say that there's no scripture to back that up. Um, to me, that's more unbelief and idolatry. And, um, you know, you know, living in anxiousness and depression, just cast, casting your cares into him first before using that as a substance to then get to into prayer, to me is a red flag. But um, all that to say, because this person is a believer and has had multiple people come to her and tell um, her that it's not, that this isn't biblical. And for her to say this actually, she feels as though that she is not sinning and she got the approval from God that it's okay. Um, do I step away from this relationship or do I, you know, continue maintain to be her friend just at a distance? You know, that this is where I'm warring is because she's a believer, it's different if she was an unbeliever, but as a believer, do I stay or do I go? I hope, I hope that makes complete sense. It makes complete sense. And I love you, niece. Um, so long, farewell, our readers and goodbye. Adieu, adieu to you and you and you get high. Get high, get high, get high. By yourself. <laughs> Bye. Multiple believers have told this woman, this is not godly. She has said she's heard from God. She got to get high by herself. Hopefully, your distance from her helps her to feel her distance from God. The Bible has precedent for biblical excommunication. When somebody is in habitual sin, not like fell in the sin. That's that's Galatians 6, right? Uh, brother, brethren, if one of you be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering that I ought, considering thy own self, lest I also be tempted. And and thank you, Holy Spirit. Let me get that real quick. It's Galatians 6. Because um, in the third verses, I think that's one and two, and then the third verse is good as well. And I like the way it says it in NLT. Okay. Uh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, verse number three. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. So when somebody falls into sin, we should restore them. But they have to acknowledge that they're actually sinning. Like, the, you said it's a red flag. This is a red blanket. <laughs> it's not even a freaking flag. This is a red blanket, and the woman has covered himself in it, and she's hotboxing herself under this blanket with her little blunt. But there's no way you're going to tell me I am getting high so I can connect to God in prayer. You have nothing from Genesis to Revelation to support that at all. And whenever you say God said something, but you can't bring it back to Scripture, stop it. Just stop it. I'd rather you say, I'm not 
at a point in my life where I want to give this up. Will you please pray for me? This has a stronghold on me. Just take it, take the L. This has a this has a grip on my life right now. Right? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hold on. Hebrews. 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Get this. Especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Now, you need to understand this. There is a difference between weight and sin. You can have something that's not a sin still weigh you down and it's not conducive to your life. That needs to go too. So everything, this ain't about, well, it ain't a sin, so I guess I'll still do it. No, some stuff is a weight and it holds you down. You got to let go of it anyway. So I would say to this woman, even if you don't think you're sinning, this is a weight. And it's such a weight, it's compromising the consciousness of your other friends. Well, if that's the case, I don't want to do it no more. Listen, I told y'all, I'm talking to my dwellers now, that all the people that don't like me for whatever reason, they don't like me, they never come back for a context to me, right? But uh, I've used strong language on this pod. Y'all would think, based on the, the, the naysayers and the detractors, y'all would think I was Dave Chappelle from the time we started this pod all the way through now, that you've had to beep, 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 Morris code the entire pod. Do you know I only use strong language on four pods total ever, ever, okay? And I meant what I said when I used those words that I used. And I know that it's not a sin. It's not a sin. And I know that it was really causing some people some like, oh, you know, they were just like, oh, man, that, that, that's kind of hard for me. It's hard for me. I'm, I might feel different, but it's hard for me, okay? Well, once I found out that um, some of the pastors that I, that I preach for have dwellers or, or people that just know about the podcast listening, and that was causing a conflict in their own minds. And that they were getting a lot of questions. They, they were answering questions at their church in different states about something I was saying on my podcast. It was no longer conducive. I still feel the freedom and liberty to use that language when, whenever I feel like using it. And I would never want to be a stumbling block to my other brothers and sisters. So I don't use it publicly on this mic no more. I don't do it. I can hold that tension. I would never let it become, I don't think it's a sin, but I'm not going to let it become a weight either. So even if this woman doesn't think it's a sin, it is a weight that's breaching the connection that she has with her other brothers and sisters in Christ. And for that reason alone, if she don't want to give it up, she's selfish. At the very least. So, yeah, that's a tough conversation you're probably going to have with her. And she's probably going to call you judgmental. And she's going to go in. She's going to gaslight you. She's going to spiritually gaslight you. That's what happens when sinners, uh, uh, when believers want to want to hold on to their sin. And when you draw a line in the sand, you all of a sudden become a Pharisee and this, that and the other child, please. Just, you know, your conviction to him that knows to do right and does wrong, to him it is sin, or to her. And so this is, this is, this is very easy. You got biblical grounds to chunk deuces, to step away from that relationship, to fall back. Hopefully, the distance in the relationship, in the, in the distance of the relationship, the Holy Spirit convicts her. And calls her back. Okay, let me let me keep going. All right, so let, I'm a, I'm gonna preface this because I because I don't uh, that way I can just get to what I what I want to say. I'm going to First Corinthians chapter number five. Um, 
yeah, in uh, in First Corinthians chapter number five, uh, Paul is addressing. There's a guy that's in the Corinthian church that's sleeping with his stepmom, and nobody's done nothing about it. Um, I'm picking up from verse number three. Even though I am not with you in person, I am with you in spirit, and as though and as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man. In the name of the Lord Jesus, you must call a meeting of the church. I will be present with you in spirit, and so with the power of, of our Lord Jesus. Then you must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns. Now, hold on. Wait a minute, Paul. You're being mean. You're being a judgmental Pharisee. Maybe you haven't met Jesus. It's all about grace, bro. No, this dude is boning his dad's wife unrepentantly, fam. The way I imagine in my mind's eye, he's knocking down his daddy's wife and then coming to church, singing oceans. Where they do that at? They shouldn't. That's where they do that at. They shouldn't do that, right? So he says, throw this person out and hand them over to Satan. Hear this. So that his sinful nature will be destroyed. Not him. The sinful nature. And here's the hope. He himself will be saved on the day of the Lord's return. Biblical excommunication is not about like condemning this person into the abyss. It's about hopefully, since you can't feel how, how far you've departed from the faith, maybe you can feel a departure from us. And hopefully, in the same way the prodigal son came to himself, hopefully this person after maybe a week, two weeks, three weeks, we hope it's always sooner than later, God, I miss Sarah. We used to always talk and I'm going to let this weed come between me and community. I'm going to let rolling blunts come between me and my friend who used to pray for me all the time, who's been believing God for me. We were in a small group together. I'm choosing weed over the body of Christ and community. Maybe she finishes it. Maybe she, you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying she has some revelation. She's like, I'm putting this out right now in my dime bag. Maybe she said, you know what? Tonight, I'm smoking the rest of it. Maybe she does. Maybe after it wears off at the four days, she's like, God, I'm medicating what only you can mend. Let me, let me, let me stop playing. I need to just be in your presence. Let, she was right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm bugging. And then if she comes back, your sister came back. Your brother came back. Throw a party. But that's what excommunication is for. It is for that person to feel the disconnect. And hopefully they come back to God and hopefully they come back to community. That's what it's for. And the people that can do it, do it. And the people that can't, can't. That's that.